Good afternoon, or at least I think it's afternoon. I did look at the provisional statement and my talk is scheduled for the afternoon. If it happens to be morning, I apologize. My name is Lori Butgreit and I'm from Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. Now, right off the bat, I want to say, while I was doing this presentation, the South African government changed the name of Port Elizabeth to this. So I'm not even going to try to pronounce that new town name right now. Um, and I apologize if anybody is offended that I said the university was in Port Elizabeth. So today I'd like to chat about a method for classifying neighborhoods in GIS applications by counting landmarks. And before I go into the details, let's just talk about classifying neighborhoods first. So I've traveled quite a bit and I can look at this photograph and I can say that's an African village. I haven't traveled so much that I can say that's an East African village or a South African village or a West African village. I've traveled enough that I can look at that and say, oh, that's a commercial district. In fact, for South Africans, they might be able to recognize it, that Santon City, uh, Santon City Tower over there. I can look at that and I can, from my experience, say that looks like an African township. It's a semi-urban area, more economic activity than a village, not quite as much economic activity as a as a business district. And from my personal experience, I can look at that and say, oh, that's farmland, that's a grain silos. And I can look at that picture and say, that looks like mining headgear, it must be a mining area. I don't have enough experience to say whether that's a gold mine or a coal mine or a platinum mine, okay? But that it's a mine. Now, for those of you who have been playing with machine learning or convolutional neural networks, you would say, oh, but you can program and train a convolutional neural network to do that also. So when I went through those photographs, I depended on my experience of yeah, traveling through Africa to be able to classify those um, images. But for convolutional neural networks and for machine learning, if you have training data, then you would be able to train a convolutional neural network to do those classifications also. And it actually works. You need to have a lot of data. You need hundreds, if not thousands, of photographs of African villages, of business areas, of farmland, of mines, etc. But a convolutional neural network would be able to do that just as well as me if not better than me. But this talk is not about using machine learning and convolutional neural networks. It's what if you don't have legally usable training data? What if you want to do a classification problem and you don't have training data? Now, let's take the words legally usable out of that in the first place. What if you don't have training data? Well, then there's no way that you can use a convolutional neural network. But what if you have training data and it's not labeled? That's sort of asking the question, what if you don't have usable training data? Training data without it being labeled is a problem. And then you may find labeled training data, but it's licensed and you can't actually use it for commercial purposes. So for example, I did a project a while back where we used images off of ImageNet and it was perfectly acceptable to use that for research purposes, but for commercial purposes there were other restrictions. Okay, so this paper is about when you do not have legally usable training data. All right, so here's the research environment. Um, yes, I'm a researcher at Nelson Mandela University, but, but I also work in industry. And I work for a company that supplies goods and services to spaza shops. Now, I think all of you know what a spaza shop is. It's an informal merchant 
um, working in Africa who sells necessities in a small little shop. Um, he'll sell milk and coffee and mealy pop, etc. And he may have a couple. He may be a, quite an entrepreneur and he may have a couple of spaza shops in, in different areas run by family members, etc. So the company I worked for provided, uh, provides Android devices to these spaza shops and the merchant would be able to sell airtime, data, electricity on these Android devices and also do some um, other types of commercial transactions, sell tickets to soccer games, pre-lockdown, bus tickets, allow people to pay some of their bills, etc. And what we wanted to be able to do is predict which areas had enough economic activity to support merchants who had our devices. So our research question is, how can we remotely or programmatically judge the economic activity in a neighborhood? So I don't work for an NGO. The company I work for needs to make money. If they go into a new township area to supply merchants with these Android devices, is there enough money in that area in the, with the people who live there to support this merchant? How could we judge the amount of free currency in a neighborhood? Now, we are not only concerned about the lack of money. If there's too much money, then these people are going to have the internet and be able to do everything they needed to do using internet banking. So we were looking for areas where there was money, but they probably didn't have internet, etc. And they would support these merchants that would have our devices. Okay, so we used design science research for this project. Design science research is a really nice research methodology when you need to use information systems or information te technology to solve a real world problem. There are a number of different types of artifacts that we um, that design science research can create. Our research created two, a method on how we can classify these neighborhoods and one test instantiation. Now the method is completely explained in the paper and I'm going over this in this presentation, but the parts of the test instantiation are company private. So we'll talk about the test instantiation, but the actual numbers that came out when, when we did the test instantiation is company private and won't be shared. So let's talk a little bit first about design science. Design science research has a number of iterations. You start with the awareness that there is a problem. Then you collect suggestions on how to solve that problem. You do some development and then you evaluate the artifact that you developed. And at that point in time, you probably have to go and get more suggestions. There's no way that your first iteration is going to solve the problem. And you do some more development and you do another evaluation. And the number of iterations can be extremely high until such time that there is a conclusion, the evaluation is successful, and you can fall through and draw your conclusions. So it was during these iterations with the stakeholders, etc., that a very interesting suggestion was made. The suggestion was that we should count the number of ATMs, automated teller machines, in an area to be able to judge the economic activity. Now, if you think about it, that's actually a fairly smart idea that the banks, before they installed those ATMs, did their due diligence to decide whether the area could support an ATM. And all we were going to do was piggyback on the research that the banks did. So our specific test instantiation is counting ATMs. But other types of research could count um, other types of landmarks. So for example, if you wanted to judge whether an area was um, 
ethnically homogeneous, all the same types of people, or ethnically diverse, you may want to count if, um, how many churches there are, how many mosques there are, and how many temples there are. If the numbers, um, if there's, for example, only temples or only mosques, as opposed to a neighborhood where there might be two churches, two mosques, and a temple, you can, you can see whether it is ethnically diverse or um, ethnically homogeneous. So for our specific test instantiation, we're going to count ATMs. All right, now, in order to count ATMs, we used the Google Places API. Now, the Google Places API is not a free API. The company under research did have an account with Google where we used a, a lot of Google Maps um, in any case. But I do want to share that programmers are allowed to set up free accounts with Google to use Google Maps, Google Places, Google Roads, um, etc. Um, you do have to have a credit card. And as long as your usage um, at the time of writing this paper was less than um, 200 US dollars, it was free of charge. Okay, so you can still play with that um, even if you don't have a full account. So the Google Places API is very similar to Google Search, except you add a longitude and a latitude and a radius and then the search term. So you're looking for ATMs within a certain radius of a certain location and you get back um, in JSON format information that looks very similar to what you might get using Google Maps or using Maps on your Android phone. So here's one that I just did um, for an area outside of Johannesburg. For those of you who are from South Africa, you may recognize this. This darker area right there is <clears throat> the Pilonisburg, um Nature Reserve or Game Park, about two and a half hours out of Johannesburg. And if you know that area, um, there's no economic activity inside of the park. At the south, you have the South Gate and you have Sun City, that um, ultra resort. And in the northeast, there is Bakatla Gate and there's a township there with a mall and a lot of economic activity. So we can look at that map and say, well, there's nothing inside the park. Um, north and northwest of the park, gee, there's not a lot of economic activity. But to the south of the park and to the northeast of the park, lots of economic activity. So we could program that and we would get back these numbers and we didn't understand what, as programmers, we didn't understand what these numbers mean. If I can find five ATMs within two kilometers of a location, what does that actually mean? So we needed to interact with the stakeholders during that iteration process to understand these numbers. Did we want to search for ATMs within a 10 kilometer radius or did we really only want to search within a one kilometer radius? If there were five ATMs there, what did that mean? If there were 50 ATMs there, what did that mean? And we were not, I want to just clarify, we were not just looking for areas with high numbers of ATMs. If it got too high, then in fact the area was almost too rich for the product that we were offering. And the people probably had internet bankings and wouldn't need the, the, the use of our device. We could classify these neighborhoods on a sliding scale. So um, neighborhoods that had less than five ATMs were different than groups of neighborhoods that maybe had between five and 15 ATMs, which were different than neighborhoods that had um, between 20 or 20 or more ATMs. The actual numbers of this, um, as I said, is company private. And this is just a simple method that we created, but the method could then be used in different projects. So I've talked about um, letting this method help guide us in finding new areas where we may want to um, try to find merchants, but it could also help us with forecasting customer churn. So customer churn has to do with merchants who leave us and go to the competitors, and it's a very competitive um, business. 
okay, so that customers might be more apt to churn in areas where there is a certain type of economic activity or a different type of economic activity. We could use these numbers in other types of projects. We could also use these numbers in trying to forecast how much money we were going to make off of this merchant. I mean, we're not an NGO. We want to make money also. So if we went into a certain area, would we be able to predict um, how, how much money this merchant was going to be able to um, spend through our devices? So this was just a small little method used and is now being embedded in other projects that we're using. And thank you, and are there any questions?